Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service. It's good to have you with us. I hope you're having a good week and uh, I hope you're enjoying the weather. It's been really lovely this week and it is good with things relaxing a little bit just to be able to get out and see the things around us. We're continuing this morning in our series in the resurrection and today we're looking at the proclamation of the resurrection. What did the early church teach about this wonderful fact? We're in Romans 10 verse 9 which uh, you probably know says that if you shall confess the Lord Jesus or Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved. And so as we're thinking of the, the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to start off with the, with the song, Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. Let's enjoy the song together. Jesus is Lord. It's a wonderful thing to be able to say and it's because he is Lord that we can come to him confidently knowing that he hears our every cry. Let's just spend a few minutes bowing before this Saviour 
that we call the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come before you, we thank you for the wonderful proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Father, we thank you this morning that he is the one who is not only Lord of all, but the one who laid down his life that we might be saved. Fathers, we come before you this morning. We thank you that we come through his name in the power of the resurrected Jesus. And we approach you, Father, with the knowledge that we can have that wonderful relationship with you because the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We thank you, Father, as we come together this morning to share in this time that we have a wonderful hope through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray as we come from different backgrounds, different experiences, from different lives altogether, we thank you that we are united in the Lord Jesus and we can share this time together, brought together by his name. We do pray for each one who is listening in this morning. Lord, we ask your blessing upon each and every one and pray that you would be near to them, that you would bless them, that you would encourage and uplift them. And gracious God, as we think upon this wonderful words that, uh, that Paul wrote so many years ago, we pray that we might make them our own and that we might see that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is Saviour and that he is sufficient for all our needs. So bless us now, Father, we pray. Draw near to us, speak to our hearts as we ask these things in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now Romans 10 and 9 tells us that Jesus is Lord, but it also tells us that Jesus is our Saviour. And our second song this morning starts off, Beautiful Saviour. Let's enjoy the song together and then after that we'll have our reading for today. <laughs> You reign, 
Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on
wonders of your mighty Today we're on the third part of our series on the resurrection. The first week we looked at the proof of the resurrection, last week the provision of the resurrection, and today we're going to look at the proclamation of the resurrection. To begin with, let's go to Acts chapter 17, where Paul is in the city of Athens, and there he is facing the learned of his day, the uh, Stoics, the Epicureans, the people who were wise and clever in their own thinking. And there in Acts 17 we read these words, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. To them, the resurrection was something completely new. They, the wise and the learned, thought that this to be some new God. You see, the Greeks, and the Romans for that matter, had gods for everything, not just for things around, but for emotions and for forces in nature. And they thought that resurrection was just another God. They'd never heard about it before. But we can tell from this and other scriptures that resurrection was an essential part of the proclamation of the gospel in the early church. And in today's passage in Romans 10, we have that well-known verse, which we used to sing to a chorus, Romans 10 and 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's speaking to us here about salvation and an essential part of it is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So, Romans 10 and 9. I don't know if you remember the old chorus. It went, Romans 10 and 9 is a favourite verse of mine. Confessing Christ as Lord, I am saved by grace divine and so on. And of course, it, it really captures, that chorus captures the importance of what this verse is all about. We're going to look today at three things that this verse or this passage brings before us. And number one, in verse nine, that Jesus is Lord. It's interesting that uh, Paul mentions the Lordship of Christ in connection 
with the resurrection. The, the two are linked and inseparably joined. This is because the, the resurrection of Christ proclaims the fact that he is Lord. Philippians 2 brings it before us very nicely. I'm sure we know the passage well. Philippians 2 verse 6, speaking of Jesus, it says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And then the focus changes and it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, and, and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have a similar thing brought before us in Colossians 1 as Paul describes the Lordship of Jesus in everything. He uses these words, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, whether in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Notice as Paul describes Jesus' supremacy in all things, in creation, in sustaining the world, he also brings in the fact that he was the firstborn from among the dead. Firstborn, of course, is a Jewish term. And it doesn't speak about first in time, but first in priority. There were other people who were brought back from the dead, but they were brought back and they died again. But Jesus, the firstborn, is the one who came out of death, conquering it and becomes the preeminent one in everything, including his power over the grave. He is the one who created all things, and he is the one who will recreate all things. So Jesus is Lord. To the early church, to proclaim Jesus is Lord was a costly thing. It was seen as a challenge to Caesar. Caesar commanded absolute obedience. And people were required to say, Caesar is Lord, but the Christians wouldn't do that. They would say, Jesus is Lord. And because of that, they were perceived as a threat. Although, as in the days of the Lord Jesus, they accused him of trying to usurp Caesar, he could say, my kingdom is not of this world. He wasn't a threat. He wasn't an opponent. He was bringing in something completely different and completely new. But for the early church to say Jesus is Lord meant that they were under attack. They were targeted. They were, in the eyes of the Romans, the enemies. If we say Jesus is Lord, what does it mean to us? What does it cost us? If we say Jesus is Lord, then he has to be Lord of everything, over every part of our life. We can't compartmentalize things and give Jesus that part of our lives, but not that. It has to be all or nothing. Jesus is Lord. We could ask what gives Jesus the right to claim lordship in our lives. Well, first of all, he created us. We had that in Colossians 1. He is the creator of all things. Secondly, he sustains us. The very air we breathe is given by him. The food we eat is provided by him. We're told that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. God is the giver of all, and Jesus 
is the one who is actually named as the sustainer of this universe. But thirdly and most important, he can claim to be Lord in our lives because he saved us. And that brings us on to our second point, that Jesus is not only Lord, but Jesus is Saviour. In verses 10 and 11, we read these words. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Here we have the glorious message. The message of the gospel in just a few words. It speaks of Jesus who is the mighty one, the Lord of all but the one who humbled himself and became obedient to death, the one who gave his life upon the cross, the one who entered into death and rose again triumphant. You know, to have any substance in our hope, there has to be resurrection. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 15, that, that great resurrection chapter, well, we've covered part of it over the last two weeks. We'll go on to see more of it, God willing, in future weeks. But in that chapter, in verses 17 to 19, we, we read these words. To have any promise, our salvation must have an eternal impact. And this is how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, if Jesus had just lived a good life and given his life upon the cross and stood in our place by taking our punishment, then we could approach God in this life. But if he had not been raised from the dead, then there would be no resurrection for us. There would be nothing in the future. There would be no eternal hope. And this is what Paul is bringing out here. That if Christ is not raised, then the hope we have, the relationship with God we have, the forgiveness we have, is only for now. But resurrection means that it stretches beyond the grave, beyond the unknown, and takes us into heaven itself and into the realms of eternity. Jesus is Saviour. But then also, number one, we have Jesus is Lord. Number two, Jesus is Saviour. Number three, Jesus is enough. He is sufficient for all. Now, how do I get that out of these verses? Well, let's take these verses in context. You know, it's very easy sometimes just to get a verse and take it on its own. We must see where it fits in. And the place where this fits in is very, very relevant. Let's go back to chapter 10, verse 1 for a moment, and we read these words, words of Paul. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. You see, Paul is writing this chapter with his own people in mind, the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. It's quite incredible when you think of that. Here was a man who was a hardened Jew. Right throughout his life, all that mattered to him was his Jewish faith and his Jewish tradition. He describes some of the things that he was in the book of Philippians. He describes himself as a Hebrew, circumcised the eighth day. That was in accord with the pattern laid down. He describes himself as a Pharisee, a zealous. All that mattered to Paul was his Jewish faith and the God that he worshipped. And he was totally sincere about that. He knew the Old Testament scriptures backwards. Yet God called him and sent him to the Gentiles. To a people that perhaps he wouldn't even have looked at before. But although Paul was sent as a, a missionary to the Gentiles, 
he still had a love in his heart and a desire for his own people to be saved. I'm sure it broke his heart as he saw the hardness of heart of his fellow Jews, those who had so much revealed to them through the scriptures, and yet they turned their back on the Messiah. And as he writes this chapter, he is talking about the need of his people, the need of the Jews to come to Christ. He's writing with his own people in mind. Paul was, in every sense, a hardened Orthodox Jew. But what he did recognize is that everyone, everywhere, had exactly the same need. Paul met all sorts of people in his travels. He met the educated in Athens. He met the cynical in the person of Festus. He met the hostile when he visited Philippi, when he was beaten and thrown into jail. He met the authoritarian in the Roman authorities. He met the apathetic in Herod, who could say, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. He met the seeker in Cornelius. He met all sorts. And he knew that each and every one of them had exactly the same need. And that included the Jew. You see, the Jew, as Paul brings before us in these chapters in Romans, they had enormous privileges. God had given them the revelation of the Old Testament. It was into the Jewish nation that Messiah was born. God had given them the prophets and the law. They had enormous privileges, but none of those privileges could ever bring them to God and make them right before a holy God. You know, the same is true about us. Not so much these days, but in, few, in past years, there were many people who really believed that a religious life, attending church, going through the motions, were all that God wanted. Church attendance is good, but it can never save us. Today, we have a lot of people going around doing good. Thank God for them. We've been all touched over the past year with story of people, stories of people who have put themselves out and gone the extra mile for others. Thank God for them. But there are some people amongst those who think that by doing so that God will look upon them with favour and accept them on the basis of what they have done. It's not enough. There are some that think that achievements can get them there. That's a bit like the Greeks in Athens. They thought that by learning, by exploring all the new opportunities, by offering sacrifices to all the gods, including the unknown god that they had built an altar to, that was enough, that they would hit upon the right one. It wasn't enough. Some people think that by living a good life, by keeping the rules, by abiding by what they should and shouldn't do, and generally doing the right thing towards others, is all that God expects. It's not enough. But Jesus is. Jesus is the only one who is enough. He is sufficient for all our needs. And Paul knew this. And as he looked at his own people, the Jews, he longed that they would come to him and accept him by simple faith. It wasn't through the ritualistic things that they did every day. It wasn't by the way they lived. It wasn't by the things that they had practiced from their childhood. It was by simple faith in Christ. You know, Paul sums it up very nicely for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, he said, It is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For the Jew, for the Brit, for the European, the Asian, the African, the American, the Australian, whatever part of the world we come from, whatever color our skin, whatever language we speak, only one is enough, and that is Jesus. 
Jesus is enough for every single one of us. All must come the same way. Paul's day is exactly the same as today. We have the same people around us. And God provides the same answer to our problems. It's Jesus. And so, to sum up, what does the fact of Jesus being raised from the dead declare to us? What should we declare to others? Number one, that Jesus is Lord. And we need not just to say Jesus is Lord, we need to practice that Jesus is Lord. Number two, Jesus is Saviour. He is the only Saviour. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And number three, Jesus is enough for all our needs, whoever we are, whatever we are like, Jesus is God's answer. Thank you for listening. May God bless you and may God be with you through the coming week. Thank you for joining us today. 
I do pray that you will be blessed and encouraged by what we shared. And I do pray that each one of us may indeed make Christ Lord of all in our lives, not just in theory, but in practice, that we might grasp the wonderful fact that he is our Saviour and that we might trust him for his sufficiency. Shall we just close with a word of prayer and uh, then our service is over. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've spent together. As we come to the close, we pray that you would be near to each one of us. Pray that as we go back into our daily lives, day by day, that we may know your sufficiency for the days that are ahead. Lord, be with us, we pray. Be near to us when we feel a need for comfort and strength. And may we at all times know your guiding hand upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this time we have shared. We pray that you would bless your word to each one of us and that you would glorify your name through us. Be with us then, Father, we pray, as we ask your blessing now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you for joining us. May God bless you.